Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see you all, and welcome to this world premiere screening of Escape at Danamora. I want to thank Armando Nunez and our friends from CBS Studios International for bringing this show to MIPCOM. This world premiere TV screening of Escape at Danamora reinforces the commitment of Showtime and of CBS to international buyers. The series' executive producer and director is Ben Stiller, the Emmy Award-winning writer, actor, director, comedian, and producer. Ben Stiller has directed a string of films and acted in a string of films that together have generated a massive $3 billion in box office revenues. But Escape at Danamora is something of a new departure for Ben because it is not a comedy, and it's the first drama series he has directed for TV. It's a sign of the times that Ben Stiller has gone on the record saying that where once Escape at Danamora would have played to cinema audiences, today it's television that provides the freedom to tell great stories. In the United States, the network that will bring Escape at Danamora to its audience is Showtime, with the first episode set to air on Sunday, November 18th. We're incredibly proud to have Showtime's president and CEO, David Nevins, with us tonight. And he'll be saying a few words after the screening when Ben Stiller will be sitting down for a question and answer session with a good friend of MIPCOM and a great reporter, Variety's managing editor of television, Cynthia Littleton. That is still to come. For now, let's all enjoy the MIPCOM world premiere TV screening of Escape at Danamora. Thank you. It's, um, it's such an honor to be able to present this to you guys and to see it on the big screen. It was, it's an incredible pleasure. And man, it's only just beginning. I've had the pleasure of seeing all eight hours, all seven episodes, and it's, uh, it just keeps going and going in all sorts of surprising ways. It's, I, I wanna, I wanna, it's, a, it's an honor to be here and I really wanna thank uh, Reed Mitem and uh, CEO Paul Zilk for inviting us to the premiere here in Cannes. Um, I definitely wanna thank Armando Nunez and his incredible team at, at CBS Studios International for hosting us this evening and uh, I also want to give a special thanks to all of our Showtime partners from around the world, many of whom are, are here tonight, for their continued support of the Showtime brand and everything that we're doing and everything that they're doing already for, uh, for Escape at Danamora, which is a big project for us in the next couple, uh, in, in the next month. Um, it is such a privilege to get to make shows like Escape at Danamora. This kind of limited series is really at the heart of, of what we're trying to do. Premium, original programming that pushes creative boundaries. We aspire to create content that drives our medium forward, that surprises and challenges us, and by the way, also really fun to watch. And when you watch where this show goes, it is totally fascinating television. We entered the limited series space uh, about a year ago and have already you know, had, had two really important shows with, uh, with shows like Twin Peaks and Patrick Melrose that got you know, well over a dozen Emmys between the two of them, uh, Emmy nominations. And we're building on these successes with, with this Escape of Danamore that you see here from Ben Stiller. It's, it's based on an, an incredible... Uh, true story from upstate New York, and I think Ben, as you can tell, has taken incredible care with every frame of film that you see, and the, the attention to detail, fascinating characters, absolutely amazing, stranger-than-fiction story, and three extraordinary actors in Benicio Del Toro, Patricia Arquette, and Paul Dano. Ben is dedicated, feels like the last two years of his life to making this film, and uh, he's been absolutely meticulous every step of the way, and I, and I think it really shows. So it's my pleasure, my honor to introduce our director, Ben Stiller. Get a hug. 
hugs you can get. I don't know if you need this. Yep, you do. And Cynthia Littleton. Hello, Cynthia. How you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Cheers. Hello, oh, Ben. Congratulations. That was Thanks. quite a... Uh, I have had the pleasure of seeing three episodes. And Thank you. on a much smaller screen. Right, this yeah. Was a, this was a nice treat, really showed off. Yeah, this is sort of the dream to see, <laughs> to see it up on the big screen. Because we always uh, thought of it, you know, pretty cinematically. And it's exciting to be able to see it that, that size. Yeah, no, I, I bet. Um, it, what struck me in watching this first episode is how much track you lay, how much world building you do in setting the kind of ecosystem of the prison, the hierarchy of who's in charge, who's not in charge, who's doing their job, Benicio Del Toro's incredible presence. You do the prison, you do the world, the community around them, very kind of a hard scrabble town, very difficult you know, living conditions during the winter, you just really capture that so well. As you, as, as you said, or as David said, this is a stranger than fiction story. How did you first dive into it? What, what made you make this film, this project? Uh, well, it was just the story itself was uh, hard to believe. And I was really attracted to the, the reality of how something like this actually happens. When I heard the, that these two guys escaped and they cut their way out of the prison and this woman who worked at the prison was uh, smuggling in hacksaw blades and hamburger meat to them. Uh, it just, it sounded made up, uh, but it really happened. And uh, it ended up being the biggest manhunt in New York State history. They were on the run for three and a half weeks in the Adirondacks. And I was just really interested in how does, you know, if I was going to make something uh, in this genre or about a prison escape, which has been done so many times, it was how to approach it from the point of uh, view of how something would really happen. And that involved setting up the relationships and the, as you said, the prison ecosystem, how everybody interacts in this world and how the prison dominated this town and does dominate that town. And really this, this part of New York State, the economy in the state, how that tailor shop worked in terms of these, uh, you know, these hardened criminals, uh, 40 uh, murderers and rapists uh, who are there working for one civilian supervisor and one corrections officer in a room with 13 inch shears um, and working for about 35 cents an hour for a real corporation that is a for-profit corporation and a, a civilian who has to oversee them and make their quota. Just that in itself was such a bizarre thing to me. Uh, so all of that was, uh, what was interesting to me, and, and so we sort of dived in, and, and as David said, it's been the last couple of years, um, and we had a chance to do some research and get up there and get to know the people up there, and that really was an important part of it. And in this format, where you have eight hours to really explore this story, it feels like you have the, you have the time to really let us know who these characters are, where they fit in this very distinctive, very, you know, rather grim world that they live in. Can you imagine trying to tell this story in a, in a two-hour feature format? Would it be possible? Uh, I think, well, there's definitely a version of it. It just wouldn't have, I think, as much of the, um, it wouldn't be as interesting because it would just be pretty reductive. You wouldn't be able to tell the stories of all the characters. And I feel what we do in the, in the seven parts is we have a chance to sort of um, uh, lay out the world uh, and then, you know, kind of build on that and hopefully it builds in terms of the, um, just the, the tension and the pace. Um, but then there's also a chance to, to tell you a little bit more about these characters. Um, a lot of times in a, um, you know, in a prison escape story, you can't help but want to identify with the, uh, with the protagonists who are trying to escape because everybody, you know, wants to see them get out. Uh, and you know, that's that I, I knew that was going to happen in this, and Brett Johnson and Michael Token, the writers, and I, we all thought about that and, and really wanted to have a chance to show who they were as people also and why they were in jail eventually and all these things, you know. So I think um, you wouldn't be able to do that in a two-hour uh, movie, and uh, I think uh, the nuances of, of the uh, reality of in terms of, like, how, how does it get to a point where these guys could actually create a relationship 
with someone. I mean, when we come in, obviously she already has a relationship going on, um, but how it gets to that and how then it changes with uh, Paul's character and how uh, Benicio's character comes in, which you start to see the beginning of at the end of the first episode, it's all based in reality. It all happened over the course of about a year, and so we thought this, you know, in trying to figure out how many episodes it should be, mm-hmm. we sort of, you know, took a guess, <laughs> really. At, you know, like, well, how, how many uh, hours can this sustain and, and what would be right? And so we sort of honed in on this um, seven-part, uh, eight-hour idea. And uh, hopefully, I, I looked at it as each episode having a, a, a very distinctive beginning, middle, and an end. And because I think you have to keep you have to want to come back and watch the next episode but overall it also has that you know the arc of the whole story but there's a chance to tell different kinds of stories within the uh seven parts and have different uh feelings to each episode Mm -hmm. you see the you get you you the the personality of each character is really deepened in subsequent episodes obviously and just letting them know let you letting the audience know what what really drove them um, let's talk about the casting. I mean, it's a it's a real tour de force for Benicio, for for Paul Dano, for Patricia Arquette. I mean, there's not a weak weak link in the in the key cast members. Can you talk about how you how you got Benicio for the for that role? Um, <laughs> it, it took a little a, a bit of time to get him. Uh, you know, he's he'd never done television before, and. Uh, he was intrigued by the project, uh, and I met with him uh, a number of times, uh, and we talked about it. He's also an artist. Uh, I think he was really interested in that aspect of Richard Matt's character. A, a visual painter, you're saying? He's a, yeah, he's also a painter. Um, and uh, we, just talk, you know, we just talked about it, and at that point, Patricia was, Patricia was the first person to come on board, and Patricia was always a first choice for me. Uh, just because she's such an amazing um, uh, actor in that she has no sense of ever wanting the audience to have to like her character or, you know, she's willing to let go of all vanity just to be the character and portray uh, a a human being who she trusts the audience will connect with on some level. She's not trying to pull you in. And uh, so she was on board. I think Benicio wanted to work with her. And then after a a number of meetings, uh, he, he decided to to dive in. He, ben, Benicio brings this like quiet menace that just grows and grows and grows. It's, um, it just, you know, what he brings to that character with the look, with that arch of an eyebrow. You that was know. all my idea. <laughs> it was all good direction. He wanted to be right? really nice and sweet and I said, no, just be like, be Benicio. And Paul Dano too is known, typically known for lighter roles. Um, how, did you, how did you happen to see him in this role? I think David Sweat's a really interesting guy because he he says that he was he claims he wasn't uh, he, he was in for murder uh, he was in for um, he killed a, a police officer uh, but he claims that there were circumstances around the, the the killing that he's not totally responsible for I think he feels like he's not a guy who should be in there um, and he felt that he had to build up and create this sort of false exterior of who he was in prison to protect himself. He would lift weights and, and act tougher than he was. And uh, I felt that Paul really, we had a chance to visit him and we, we spent about five or six hours with him. And I think Paul you know, has that, that sort of inner sensitivity um, and, and uh, that feeling that I think Sweat feels about himself and what was great was to see Paul sort of, you know, put on that, that tougher exterior that I think David Sweat put on as a protection in prison also. Do you know, did Patricia get the chance to meet with the real Joyce? Uh, I think Patricia chose not to meet with Joyce. And she, I think she watched her interviews and we read all of her transcripts of, of all of her interviews with the state police and she felt that she wanted to have some distance from her. And, uh, but yet, uh, the Inspector General of New York, who saw the series, felt uh, that she really captured her essence from her, her having spent time with her. And I think, uh, I, you know, I think Patricia just, she's such a complicated character, and she's not one thing or the other. You know, at one point you feel like, well, she's being manipulated, and then on the other hand, she's really manipulating 
a, a lot of people also. So you know, there's it's it's really interesting to kind of figure out who she is. I think all throughout the series, she's reveals more and more about the character. Obviously, as the series goes on, and she just she just breaks your heart with the complexity that she brings to that. Yeah, I mean, it's hard because Tilly, you know, if you talk to the Inspector General of New York, she would say, Tilly doesn't break your heart. She's, you know, she, she really feels that she's a bad person because there was a, a conversation of, eventually they plot to escape and one of the questions that comes up is what to do about uh, Tilly's husband, Lyle. And uh, there was a, a point in time where they were considering prosecuting uh, Joyce... Tilly for, for murder, or attempted murder, because uh, there was a plan to kill her husband, to get rid of her husband. And Richard Matz, uh, I guess, I don't know, spoiler alert, did you guys, am I allowed to tell you? Well, it's, everybody knows, he died, Richard Matt died. Um, and uh, nobody knows what his side of the story is. David Sweat cl claims that they weren't trying to kill, that he wasn't trying to kill her husband, but um, it was insinuated that, uh, that Tilly did want them to kill her husband. So it's hard to understand where the truth lies in all of this because one person's not alive and the other two aren't necessarily telling the truth. Right, and you've done, you've done a lot of work, research to kind of piece it all together. Another great, great bit of casting is Bonnie Hunt as the New York Inspector General who about a year after the actual breakout, as you and I talked about, there was a report that came out that reads like a novel. Uh, in terms of all the detail of, of all of that. And Bonnie Hunt is just such a, it's a little off type for her, but it's, she just did, delivers such a great performance. Yeah, well, she's a very good actor, and, you know, she's obviously very funny. Um, but when I met Catherine Leahy Scott, the Inspector General, I thought she, she's a really smart, funny, um, tough uh, Inspector General who, but she has a great sense of humor about her job. And when we met with her, that was where we had the idea, really, to cast, to actually create the character of the Inspector General when we were uh, breaking out the series, because we felt that report was really important. But then when we met her, we felt she was such an interesting character that it would be great to see it through her eyes and sort of bookend the story through her um, investigation, which is really what ended up being the source material for the show. Um, you teamed with... Uh, a lot of the producers, producers and writers that have worked on Ray Donovan, the Showtime series, to to bring this to life. Can you talk about how you became involved in this? It's been quite a commitment for you to to direct all episodes. Yeah, I mean, I guess they just went. They offered it to so many people who turned it down that <laughs> it finally got to me because I was I was so happy to to, to get sent the material. Um, I didn't know them at all. I didn't know Brett or Michael Tolkien. I, I knew who Michael was uh, from his, you know. He, he wrote The Player and um, uh, has directed a couple of movies. And uh, I, I got sent the script that they wrote about two months after the escape happened. And I thought it was really well written. And I, I asked them how much of it was true. And they said, well, we made up a lot of it because we don't know. And I was like, OK. And I, 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 I had to figure out if I thought I could make that version. And I felt I couldn't because I really didn't have a take on it. I didn't want to just make up a prison escape story. What was interesting to me was the reality. So I passed on it and I said, thank you, but I just don't think I can figure out how to do this. And then when the Inspector General report came out a few months later, we, we all called each other up immediately because we were so excited to read it. And I said, if you, didn't have, if you don't have a director still, maybe we should start from scratch, you know, using this, uh, this report as our source material and just try to do everything uh, from, from the real, just as much of the real story as possible. And then we started reading all of the transcripts and then we started going up to Dan Amora and we had about a year while we were putting the show together and casting it and writing it to be able to go up there and start to meet everybody. And then eventually the governor of New York State, um, uh, Governor Cuomo, allowed us access to the prison. So those scenes that you see when they're on the yard uh, and, they're, and they're sketching and he's talking about the shadows, that's on the, act the actual north yard of Clinton Correctional where at, at the court where David Sweat and uh, Richard Matt would, would hang out and do that. So that was amazing for us to have the access to the real prison and, that, that, and, and the technical advisors that we got from the real prison to be able to really tell the story and I think in a much fuller way. Did you, all of this is, the subject matter, the tone is different from things that you've directed in the past. Did you, did you pursue this because you wanted to stretch a different muscle as a director? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I've always been interested in, in uh, directing different kinds of things. It just has never really happened. And uh, when this happened, uh, you know, when this came to me, this material, I was, I just was taken by the, the combination of elements in it because it wasn't just a genre piece. It wasn't just an escape story. It was about human relationships, and it was kind of, it was a drama. I, you know, I, I thought it might be, it could be a little funny also, um, but it ended up being a little. Uh, more serious, um, but I, I don't think, um, for me, it's, it's something I've always wanted to do, and really, it, it, it harkened back to the movies that I grew up watching, uh, and television shows also, that, that the tone of, of movies from the 70s, like Dog Day Afternoon, or Taking a Pelham 123, uh, or Straight Time, um, uh, where you know they, they were dramas, but there was humor within them. Straight Time doesn't have as much humor, but they were dramas that had uh, real characters that were complicated and were character-driven pieces that were not heavy on plot. Um, but I found them fascinating, and you know that's the kind of movie that I always wanted to make uh, growing up. So I, in this material, I saw an opportunity for that. Because there's something about the prison, too, that's really timeless in that when you go into the prison, there's no, you know, you can't bring your phone in. There's no cameras, no phones. So communication is like it's pre-digital. So people are forced to pass notes to one another or a nod or just a look or a little whisper means so much. And the, that place is stuck in time. I mean, it just, it's, it, you go in there and it, and it could be 1930, it could be 1970. And uh, that lent itself, I think, to the tone of what we were doing, too. Well, even though some of us know how it ends, we're very interested to see more. Congratulations, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.